specialists of uh, specialists of American literature have declined over the years uh, because it's considered to be a, a bit of a niche area, which of course it is because it is uh, slightly removed from mainstream uh, British literature and canonical literature, uh, though it is it has its you know tangible connections as well. Now, uh, a brief uh, you know uh, backdrop to my uh, own orientation to American studies. Um, I happen to kind of myself uh, have a special paper in, in Jadapur uh, during my PGs in American literature. And I remember that it was divided into two categories, the 19th century portion and the 20th century portion. So uh, I will keep that structure in mind when I you know, uh, talk about my uh, topic today. And I would also like to mention that I was uh, associated with JUSAS, the Jadapur University Society for American Studies, for a very long time, and who, who, which held uh, periodical, you know, lecture seminars and other uh, forums to promote American literature, uh, and uh, a long time associate with uh, the American Center. Yusufi, uh, that also holds similar programs, and I happen to remember a particular. Um, day when uh, the consul, the, the then consul general Helen Lefebvre invited us uh, to the consulate of residence in, in Ho Chi Minh Shoroni uh, and she wanted to understand how a blueprint could be framed for uh, continuing this flagship further. So based on that, um, I decided to take this up because uh, this is a topic which I think uh, has lots to you know comment on, but I, I decided to streamline it uh, to your advantage. So uh, let's begin with realism because uh, realism in general now seems to have uh, fallen out of favor, considered uh, a bit in passe because uh, critical humanism, critical posthumanism, apocalyptic futurisms, uh, and other such you know. Um, Dawn, donning the hats have, uh, you know, come about. And it is my contention, though, that realism, particularly social realism, is terribly underrated, though not unrepresented in fictive creations. Realism definitely has to do with fidelity to verisimilitude. And uh, I would hold that realism manifests itself through subjective correspondence with scientific inquiry, but simultaneously cohering through uh, intuitive realization. Now, the immediate material objective of social realism, quote unquote, is to critique power structures that downplay the welfare of the working class. American social realism has its roots in European realism, but more attuned to hegemony and victimization. No thanks to America's official embracement of capitalism. One should not use this interchangeably, and this is very important, that you should not use social realism interchangeably with socialist realism, because uh, the latter has to do with uh, Soviet socialist realism institutionalized by Stalin in 1934. Uh, glorification of communist values, the emancipation of the proletariat, classical perfection in sculpture, progressively partisan, engineered to promote partisanist ideas. These were the trends of socialist realism that came from Russia. But uh, I think they, they, this might have some bit of a connection with the social realism of America as well, because the new Soviet man uh, that uh, subscribed to the fascist paradigm uh, has taken recourse to the mode of this mode of realism, uh, which is manifest in Hitler's main camp, 1925, uh, where Hitler describes his failure to crack the entrance exam of the Academy of Fine Arts, Vienna. He was rejected twice. When he came to power, Hitler ensured that realism was state ordained. So realism became a means of state control. Um, a means to devise, you know, state operations. The Volk, as it was called, was uh, portrayed at cultivation and the Heimat was uh, showcasing patriotism. 
Nordic beauty and Nazi perfection, owing to Greco-Roman and Aryan superiority ideas, uh, which were uncontaminated by miscegenation, became the staple of the art of the Third Reich. Anything else, except especially the Weimar variety of art, was degenerate. Now, America has had its own share of socio-economic problems. It still is continuing in a major way. But being the land of individualism, such regimentation in artistic representation was not present. So we don't have that regimented idea of reality in, in American fiction, especially in the American novel. The American novel in particular displays a variety of themes and content, both in terms of a positive and negative reception of the ideas of the great American dream. Now, all of you who have an inkling of an orientation with American literature and culture know that the formulaic idea of the great American dream is central to almost everything American. Okay. Uh, and, and, it can be utopian like anything, and it can be dystopian like anything as well, which I'll come to in course of my lecture. Now, uh, Horatio Alger Jr., a very less known uh, writer, who started writing formulaic rags to riches, juvenile novels, a prominent example being Ragged Dick, being a perfect example of this kind of, you know, uh, uh, realist mode of fiction that we have come to know. All kinds of aspirants to this American dream could be found. So it was very cohesive uh, from the po point of view of the social structure. You could see boot blacks, you could see newsboys, you could see peddlers, you could see buskers, all kinds of people participated in their formulaic idea of the American dream. Then we have Stephen Crane, who you know, wrote the very famous Red Badge of Courage, 1895. Now, this, you know, received great critical acclaim in the subgenre of the Civil War novel, valorizing heroism and maturation. Uh, the soldier in this particular novel, whose name is Henry Fleming, uh, has positive qualities because self-knowledge, self-command, these came from the marches, sieges, and conflicts in battle. However, you also have a memoir, though I'm talking about the American novel, I would like to just mention the name of this memoir. This is a memoir by Sam R. Watkins. It is called Co.Itec. Co.Itec persisted in a Shavian anti-romanticism because he highlighted the more overlooked factors uh, of the army, like meagerness of soldiers' rations, neglect of mutilated bodies, uh, the sordid business of war that, you know, the very iconic American uh, rock band, hard rock band, Guns N' Roses, uh, so wonderfully depicted in their song, Civil War. Uh, the line uh, from that song is, what's so civil about war anyway? So there's a pun on the, on, on, on the word civil between uh, civility and civilian. So indeed, there is nothing civil about uh, civil wars, but the American Civil War was a major uh, determinant uh, of American realism uh, down the line. And so the time period from 1860 to 1900 becomes very crucial to the understanding of uh, the American realist novel. Now, uh, one particular name I would like to mention in this context is William Dean Howells. Howells was noted as the first American author to bring a realistic aesthetic to American literature. Uh, and it was none other than Ernst Hemingway who credited the author Mark Twain, whose original name was Samuel Clements, to capture the real voice of America. So it was believed till then that all the other writers who had written so far couldn't really be authentic about uh, the climb of America, so to say. So uh, let's say Mark Twain becomes the authentic trademark, the hallmark of social realism. Twain uh, did not stick to literary techniques, but uh, 
he discarded some of the formal literary techniques and introduced colloquialism slang caustic humor to explore the gentlemanly conventions of his predecessors now the interestingly the name mark twain it's it's a pen name it comes from uh, the idea of piloting a steamboat on the mississippi river now the landsman's cry for a measured river's depth of 2 fathoms which is 12 feet is uh, safe water for a steamboat to ply now this is known as uh, you know this is hailed as mark twain this is famously referred to as that twain made a lot of money especially from europe that he even tried entrepreneurship down the line which of course bombed and made him file for bankruptcy also twain got interested in parapsychology after he claimed to have foreseen the death of his own brother henry in a steamboat explosion the boiler of the steamboat pennsylvania that was the name of the steamboat pennsylvania actually exploded killing henry Twain also uh, related his own birth and death to the appearance of the Halley's comet which uh, also came true so when the Halley's comet first appeared Twain uh, was born and when it passed out uh, his death occurred so uh, you see like this is my contention that sometimes reality per se is more strange and experimental than either modernism or postmodernism or reality per se will credit it for in fact even before the civil war we find fenimore cooper's uh, novels you know fenimore cooper was writing romantic novels of frontier adventurism uh, influenced especially by walter scott the scottish uh, writer and uh, hawthorne was also writing nathaniel hawthorne was also writing bloodless allegories uh, the most famous one being the scarlet letter and of course uh, melville was writing metaphysical novels like moby dick uh, many of you might not have read these novels but you definitely have heard uh, about them in passing or read abridged versions of these novels william dean howells's uh, very famous work the rise of silas lafan and a hazard of new fortune put forward local colorism and regionalism to the fore but it would become quaint down the line because america was increasingly losing its uh, loose federal structure and becoming a stratified plutocracy i think which it is uh, now also moreover racial homogeneity was being lost uh, because of you know rapid uh, infiltration of immigrants and uh, people of color provincial experiences Uh, proving flimsy and the victorian genteel tradition was breaking down so the end of the civil war marked the dawn of the 20th century and this is the you know timeline from where the second part of american studies come about which is why one would find a cultural paradigm shift between 19th century and 20th century american literature this is very obvious because if you compare a work like uncle tom's cabin with a work like let's say tony morrison's beloved you would find stark differences uh, in stylistic and thematic content though certain ideas remain uh, similar so uh, the rise of robber barons these guys were known as robber barons like uh, rockefeller and rockefeller and carnegie uh, we have institutions named after them we have the rockefeller foundation and we have the carnegie mellon university the rise of the populist parties like the grange uh, we have labor disputes uh, in operation bossism uh, around the corner and uh, the scientific ideas of darwin marx comte spencer these were developing very you know profoundly and they undercut most of the 19th century religious ideas prevalent at that point of time so the scientific temper was uh, kind of uh, deflating some of the time tested uh, religious ideas that were prevalent in america don't don't forget that america was also a land that had a religious indoctrination uh, in in its foundation so by 1890 the frontier closed down 
And in 1891, we have the International Copyright Act coming. And the idea of the Nietzschean Superman uh, become increasingly popular around this time. So what do we have in, in, in this new mode of American fiction that was coming about? We have the discarding of flowery junk and uh, pretty stories, as they were called. They were followed with a replacement of clarity, order, and economy of words. So you see most, most of the uh, prototypical stuff that we associate with romantic literature per se or idealistic literature per se was getting increasingly discarded. Vernacular diction was introduced, especially by Twain, if you remember, because uh, the stiff upper collar uh, British English or Queen's English was not found suitable for the American habitat. And uh, there was much of comic satiric and matter of fact tone. Uh, it is very clear from much of the snooty language that you found uh, that was discarded. Uh, there was a lot of mobility from West America to South America to the uh, Northeastern part of America. You know, there was an increasing uh, concentration of people in, in around the Northeast and life became more and more materially driven. And this is the age that we know as the Gilded Age. Mind you, please note down, those of you who are taking notes, that the Gilded Age becomes a defining, uh, you know, uh, epoch to mobilize uh, the flow of realist literature in America. To quote Mark Twain, uh, characters were shaped who were not only reacting, but acting, you know, so long you have had characters who were just reacting to their environmental changes. But now you have characters who are acting upon them uh, to these fluctuations in the social environment. The theme of appearance and reality, appearance versus reality became increasingly pronounced. And the human urge to control destiny became stronger. Now, this, this is also known as the muck-wrecking decay. It's known as the muck raking decay because it's like, you know, all the muck, all, all the shit that you find in and around you, you are raking it and, and trying to examine it because that's the only reality that you are left with. And this was profoundly influencing artistic personalities. For instance, I can give you the example of Fra Frank Norris. Frank Norris, for example, initially was a romantic uh, perceptual writer, but Increasingly, he gave up his romantic projections and opted for a mixture of uh, realism and what I would say Zolaesque uh, naturalism inspired by Emily Zola. Realism uh, featured middle class people and quotidian mobility of everyday life, whereas naturalism took it one step further, pegging Literary realism with scientific theorization, often featuring lower and lower middle class characters, influenced by environment, social depravity, heredity, and over which uh, autonomous control is lacking. Uh, we have exemplary, exemplary violence, poverty, alcoholism, corruption, prostitution, of which American literary literature in general has a very heavy dose. You know, this is what students often ask me that why is there so much of excess of these uh, negative uh, aspects of uh, American social life? Maybe you do not always find in hardcore British literature. Uh, I think it has to do with uh, the idea of the American dream, which till the post-millennial phase was perfectly in operation. Even in the 90s, the idea of the rags to riches story made a uh, big appeal, especially if I got a chance to uh, lecture you on uh, Hollywood, uh, you'd come to know that there were movies. There are movies, al almost all the movies, they peg on the idea of the positive or the negative aspects of the American dream. Pretty Woman being a very good example of, uh, you know, uh, the Cinderella story come true. But uh, mind you, uh, that, that doesn't always happen. So, when it doesn't happen, when plans don't go according to your projection, then these uh, negative elements take over. So the idea of the great American novel, which uh, was later, you know, uh, 
projected as GAM, G-A-M. This became popular around uh, this time, 1868, coined by John William de Forest. De Forest. Now, canonicity was uh, equivalent to a national epic, and, and Forrest himself, a Civil War novelist, uh, refused to admit the predecessing novelists like Washington Irving and Nathaniel Hawthorne in this canon. He uh, even excluded Fenimore Cooper. Uh, Fenimore Cooper has a very you know, powerful novel, a very popular novel called The Last of the Mohicans, uh, which was also filmed. And uh, of course, these novels were discarded because they were not found to be qualifiable enough uh, under the banner of the great American novel. Instead, we have had uh, novels like Herman Melville's Moby Dick and Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, uh, which could be fitted with the applause of uh, the great American novel. And of course, most certainly F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby definitely fitted the title of, of this uh, prototype of this novel. Although popular culture critics welcome even, you know, uh, Comics and comic strips into this category. Uh, they include uh, works like um, the Marvel comics by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, uh, co-creators of the extremely popular fictional superheroes like Spider-Man, the X-Men, Iron Man, Thor, the Incredible Hulk, Black Widow, the Fantastic Four, Black Panther, Daredevil, the Doctor Strange, Scarlet Witch, and Ant-Man. Uh, I personally don't argue against this inclusion, uh, though, you know, purists might opine otherwise, because um, after Twain's Huckleberry Finn and Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, these are definitely, you know, the upcoming candidates for the great American fiction. Uh, but speaking about novels, uh, I would, uh, you know, shortlist, I have shortlisted some novels which I felt definitely fitted this category of uh, realist great American novel writing. So you have William Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom, 1936. Uh, you definitely have John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, 1939. Uh, some of you remember who are with me in Facebook that I had, uh, you know, uh, posted uh, the picture of uh, a migrant woman, the painting called Migrant Woman. And uh, it was actually uh, that particular painting that inspired Steinbeck to, you know, write The Grapes of Wrath, which down the line became very popular. And of course, by in, in 1951, you have J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye. In 1952, you have Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, very important novel. 57, you have Anne Ryan's Atlas Shrugged. 1960, you have Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, considered as uh, one of the, I, I would say, top three novels that influence uh, American literature and still influences American people uh, because of its treatment of racism. And around 1973, you have Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, though I wouldn't really qualify that as a realist novel. And in 85, you have Cormac McCart's Blood Meridian. All these works are heavily realistic uh, in the critical sense of the term. Because uh, though Gravity's Rainbow becomes an exception, as I told you, it fuses historical fiction with postmodernism, the remaining novels have stories dealing with the immediacy of uh, social superficialities, racial victimization, and trauma gender-based injustices, sometimes multiple stylistic molds are interfused into the same package, such as a romantic suspense novel is fused with uh, a borderline case of science fiction. Or, uh, you know, uh, a work like, uh, let's say, uh, having to do with dystopian American ideas uh, gets interfused with a philosophical detective story. Atlas Shrugged is a very you know, prominent example of this. And Blood Meridian, the other novel that I was talking about, it fuses the epic Western with the anti-Western uh, as the unnamed kid 
teams up with the Glanton gang who are scalp hunters of Native Americans. So what is scalp hunting? It's, it's just this that, you know, you, uh, you kill the Native American people and you shred their hair, uh, the entire, with the scalp, you know, you, you shred the head off after killing them, of course. And that is a sign of your trophy. Okay. Uh, I don't know during uh, the partition, I've read some of the stories where, you know, both Hindus and Muslims, they, after killing each other, uh, they would be cutting off the male genitalia. And uh, that would be proof that they have, uh, you know, committed something dastardly uh, in the line of their community. Now, uh, increasingly, these things were done, not only for any mercenary interest, but sometimes for just pleasure and, and out of a sheer sense of nihilistic habit. And Harold Bloom has used the term the authentic apocalyptic novel for this particular book of realist fiction, Blood Meridian. So you can see that these tangible problems of America uh, do not allow you know, uh, writers usually to overstep or overlook the real concerns that are pressing their motherland. And I'll come to later when and why, you know, experimental forms of fiction become popular. It's not that America doesn't have its share of experimental writers. Otherwise, Stephen King would not have been so popular. But in general, you know, there are so many aggravated social problems that uh, they cannot be bypassed. You have E.C.E. Miller, who writes for the bustle, uh, describing that social realism in American novel remains as pertinent as ever and marking the voice of a generation to come the next great american novel what that would be so this speculation remains open that whether the gam has closed its gates or it is a processing continuation the great american novel is still being written this is a contention that has been debated and all said and done, the very idea of the Hall of Faming in fiction, you know, like even in fiction you have, uh, as in Hollywood, the idea of Hall of Faming, uh, it was to resume the read matter and rescue it from the clutches of white America. So I have found out that I think um, even in contemporary writing, racism, the race problem, racial inequality, becomes a burning topic of exploration. And, and that makes accounts for the hardcore treatment of uh, realism, social realism in American fiction. In addition to the ones that I have mentioned, uh, you should not think that we should stop there because uh, I, would, I would give you a personal anecdote. I was in North Bengal University and I was talking with um, a Fulbright fellow who had come there uh, and uh, we were talking about American literature since I, I happened to teach that at several institutions. So um, he asked me, what are the novels that you guys teach? And I said, well, we teach The Scarlet Letter and Moby Dick and so on, because uh, these are very important. And then he said that, but then if, if it was in America, these uh, works would have been shelved out of the window. Um, I said that in India, we don't do that. In India, we always treat classics as sacrosanct. You know, they're very important. Uh, you can't teach, uh, uh, you know, uh, a very novel writer like uh, Neil Mukherjee by throwing away Arkanarayan. In India, it doesn't happen that way. And he said that, no, in America, you know, since the decentralized mode of education is there, the students get to choose uh, their course content along with their faculty. So more contemporary works are chosen. Now, I have seen that Miller, when he was, you know, E.C. Miller, when he was framing this idea, he uh, debated that if you were not to read uh, works which, were con which are considered classics by now, like The Scarlet Letter or Moby Dick or Uncle Tom's Cabin, what would you read? Would any you know, 21st century work of fiction or contemporary writing in America or writing which is not very dated, be still considered classics in that sense, you know, still considered realist works uh, of fiction to be taken into consideration or included under banners like GAN. Uh, so I have found out from uh, that exploration that uh, if you read, let's say, 
the Scarlet Letter, 1850, mind you. And if you compare that or contrast that with the 1982 Alice Walker's The Color Purple, you would find that both of these novels, despite their enormous time gaps, they deal with the commodification of uh, women's bodies, uh, especially when women take agency of their own lives and step outside social norms. Uh, one is in the 17th century Puritan Massachusetts Bay Colony, and the other is in the 1900s rural Georgia. So there is a time scale difference. There is a spatial difference as well. But the treatment of the content uh, is more contemporary in, I think, uh, the color purple rather than in the Scarlet Letter. Because uh, Hester Prime operates in a Puritan environment which might not be found in the color purple, but the color purple uh, considers the, the double treatment of race and gender in such a wonderful way that you would find that more pertinent with your immediate surroundings. Again, if you contrast Herman Melville's 1851 classic Moby Dick, most of you know about that. There, there are wonderful film versions of this as well. And if you contrast that with a very, uh, you know, uh, recent work, not very recent, but still recent enough, Sana Jeter Nazloon's Ahab's Wife, the name of this novel is Ahab's Wife, uh, colon, or The Stargazer. Note the subtitle, The Stargazer. It talks about not Captain Ahab, who has been talked about a lot by Herman Melville and his wooden leg and running about the Pequod trying to hunt the white whale. It's not Ahab's story anymore. It is the story of Ahab's wife, Una or Una, uh, because Melville had given her only one paragraph in that big book called Moby Dick. She got only one paragraph, okay? And uh, Una's re resilience, her sense of rebellion, her heartbreak, her subjectivity is highlighted in this novel. Uh, so I would recommend you to read this novel, uh, not just from a feminist point of view, but from a, a woman's point of view as well. Uh, her sense of estrangement and the predicament that she deals with. Of course, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald became a very noted uh, novelist at, at that point of time. Uh, other than The Great Gatsby, you have Tender is the Night, This Side of Paradise, so if you compare the novel This Side of Paradise with a more contemporary novel like Sunil Yapa's Your Heart is a Muscle the Size of a Fist. Please note the title. Your Heart is a Muscle the Size of a Fist. Okay, Fist. Uh, this becomes more interesting because uh, in Fitzgerald's novel, you know, you, you have as a protagonist Amory Blaine, who is a Princeton student, a student of Princeton University, and he is a post-war youth. And since he comes from such a very high, uh, you know, social position, he turns out to be a bad poet as well. But if you contrast that protagonist, if you contrast Amory Blaine with the contrast of Sunil Yapa's novel, uh, the, the, the protagonist's name is Victor, you would find that Victor is not a dreamer. Victor is a post-millennial activist. Uh, he is also a traveler and he participates in the 1999 World Trade Organization protest that was held in Seattle. So instead of you know, subjective wailing, contemporary novels inspire you to participate in uh, activism. In, in social protest movements so that you can have your stake in society. Uh, of course, I can, this list is very big. I have made a short listing of uh, my favorite choices. Uh, for instance, there is the novel called Edith Wharton's The House of Mirth, very famous novel, where you have the protagonist Lily Bart. And uh, Lily Bart has been uh, called the female Jay Gatsby. You know, uh, Mr. Gadsby in The Great Gadsby uh, was sort of the prototypical American. And in this case, the female, uh, you know, sidekick or the, or the female, uh, you know, version of uh, Mr. Gadsby becomes uh, the protagonist of 
uh, Wharton's novel, Lily Bart. Uh, but the same ideas predominate. The cautionary of the great American dream of pitfalls and pressures of social climbing, they are always there. So mind you, the great American dream is there all along, even in, uh, you know, uh, Twitter trends and uh, Instagram trends, you would find that there is this idea of the great American dream that owning a Lamborghini or owning a Mustang or the way Tom Cruise, you know, highlights the uh, Mobikes, uh, that becomes a powerful symbol of achievement in America. But at the same time, there is the other side of America as well, which you might have found in uh, you know, American romanticism in, in the face of transcendentalism. Uh, in transcendentalist poetry, you might have had this idea of renunciation and social welfare. In fact, uh, if you read uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's latest novel, The Lowland, uh, you would find that the uh, first generation character doesn't want to be an academic, doesn't want to be like uh, her mother or father. Instead, she wants to be more related to earthy causes. She wants to be more associated with uh, local issues uh, than you know, global issues, or she wants to connect it locally using Zygmunt Bauma's face. So uh, this is something that uh, I, I would like to stress upon time and time again. Again, you have William Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom. I mentioned about this novel just a little while back. Absalom, Absalom discusses the cultural shifts of the North-South American adjustments post-Civil War. So, you know, after the Civil War, the divide between the North and the South, which was always there, that became more pronounced. Uh, there was an increased migration from uh, the South to the North. And uh, America, though, being a singular land, it became divided. It happens, uh, you know, even in other nations, but in this case, it became more pronounced. Whereas if you read uh, a more contemporary novel like Amy Tan's The Joy Luck Club, very important novel, The Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan, um, you would find that this, this uh, you know, this idea of pangs from having to shift from South America to North America is nothing because uh, this talks about a Chinese immigrant family's displacement. You know, they are displaced by war, marriage and, uh, you know, cultural adaptation. They have tremendous challenges because uh, the Chinese are not easily welcome in, uh, in America. And of course, I will also briefly talk about the uh, issue of the hyphenated identities that are so crucial to American uh, fiction. You see, you will never find anyone say that I'm a white, uh, you know, Christian American. The idea of American is, is exclusively associated with whiteness and Christianity. But then you always have Indian American, Chinese American, Jewish American. Uh, so these hyphenated identities are sometimes uh, stereotyped through nationality, internationality, and sometimes stereotyped through uh, religion, which is uh, which are considered to be offbeat. For instance, you have the very famous novelist Saul Bellow. Saul Bellow, uh, who had written Herzog um, and 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 uh, Humboldt's Gift, very famous novels to do with the Jewish community in America. Uh, Saul Bellow had objected to. Saul Bellow had objected uh, to using the idea of uh, uh, the idea of religious tags to his personality. He said that I'm just a writer. You know, you don't have to say I'm a Jewish American writer. Uh, that is unnecessary and that is an insult. So uh, I would go with what Saul Bellow says, but then you know, sometimes uh, white America says that it becomes important to understand your ethnicity, your origin, your uh, cultural location. So we have to use the hyphenated identities. It's an irresolvable paradigm. Uh, so coming back to John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, uh, this became a National Book Award winner and also a Pulitzer Prize Award winner. Uh, it talked about tenant farming. Okay, and tenant farming became very difficult in America because of you know increasing pools of drought and uh, the tendency to industrialize agriculture, of which the migrant mother is part of the photo series that captured the pangs of you know tenant crisis. 
But if you uh, read a work by, let's say, Christina Henriquez, uh, and, and you would increasingly have a lot of uh, Latina, Latino, Chicano writers also in operation because they, were, they are the new voices of American realist fiction uh, in many ways than one. This novel is called The Book of Unknown Americans, won't you? The Book of Unknown Americans, and it is uh, more contemporary. The Book of Unknown Americans, and it is more contemporary as it tries to uh, narrate the story of undocumented Americans. Mind you, these Americans who are always on the move and they don't have proper papers, and uh, it's, it's not that uh, India has, always, has been the only country who has been victimized by uh, the need to show papers time and time again. Uh, America has these problems as well, and, and they are called the undocumented Americans. So uh, the Americans who are always on the move, uh, not for adventure, but for necessity. And this is captured so beautifully in this particular novel. Uh, it is an easy guess uh, that the catcher in the rye has become the best coming of age realist American novel. It is uh, a hot favorite of many people, especially because of the idea of the retention of innocence. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's the idea that, you know, you happen to progress into adulthood and you would fall down the cliff. So the catcher would, you know, catch you and put you back to your innocent phase, will not let you enter the songs of experience. Um, and uh, this is featuring a male protagonist called Holden Caulfield. But if you read, uh, you know, and, and one of my personal favorite, The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath, uh, you would find almost a sister novel equivalent to Salinger's mouthpiece. Because the same concerns, youth angst, identity crisis, the suffocating deadpan of societal expectations, all of these would be found here as well. So uh, the idea is not to read the mainstream works that I'm talking about, of course, you would do that. And that has to be done if you, if you are studying the literature. But the idea is also to take in the parallel voices that exist and compare and contrast them so that you can get the total picture, the total story. Again, uh, if you read a work called Americana, Americana, C-A-N-A-H, Americana, this novel is by... Uh, Shimananda Nogozi Adichi. Okay, Adichi's novel features Ifemelu, the character called Ifemelu. Uh, you would also find the idea of the invisibility of uh, you know non mainstream characters as you would find in Ralph Allison's Invisible Man. You see, Ralph Allison's Invisible Man is. Uh, not suffering from the same predicament that you would find in A.G. Wells's The Invisible Man. That's, that's different. That's uh, science fiction. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man is invisible because others refuse to see him. Okay. Very recently, we have had the death of, uh, I would say, the murder of uh, George Floyd. Many of you might have seen uh, the Minnesota mishap that had occurred, that this white cop had uh, strangulated him to death. Uh, at one point of time, I was going through the uh, videos of George Floyd, who was not so bad a man, and uh, he used to talk about the idea of going against the gun culture, that the gun culture was killing America. And he said that you are either going up or you are going down. So you have to choose your path very carefully. And it's this kind of a man who has to suffer uh, racial abuse, which leads to the, or which has led to the uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter, which came even before this, but um, hashtags like hashtag Black, Black Lives Matter have, have increasingly taken up this agenda, which has been spoiled by, I would say, the post-Trump regime uh, that has, uh, you know, totally done away with, uh, you know, the chasms that uh, were smoothened out in the Obama regime and in the Clinton regime. So uh, when you have the US president going and telling you that, you know, like, go out and hit that black man and I'll pay for your legal fees, then obviously uh, that is a wrong example that is being set. And, and these, uh, you know, burning social, um, you know, uh, realities, I should say, 
uh, in the plurisignified sense of the term, get highlighted in these kind of you know fictional works. So Americana's uh, protagonist is far less invisible that way. It is ironical, uh, but it is true. And my next uh, novel of discussion is uh, Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. Now, uh, you would say that Novokov is Russian, uh, but why in uh, this category? But it, quite ironically and interestingly, it is the only uh, Russian work that has featured in the great American novel category. Okay. Uh, and uh, the lines between victim and perpetrator are blurred in this novel. You know, so the idea of offense and defense is not very clear. But the portrayal of gender, class, race, and sexual abuse uh, by cisgender folks is clearly free of equivocation in Dorothy Allison's Bastard Out of Carolina. Please read this novel if you get the chance. Bastard Out of Carolina, Dorothy Allison, where the young heroine, her name is Ruth Anne Brathwit, uh, she is very clear about uh, the victimization that she has suffered. So uh, you have a, a turn of the century uh, shift to feminism and, 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 and uh, feminism not of the bad breed, but feminism of the right breed, where uh, I think uh, ambiguities of sexual engagement are done away with. This is also a very important novel from the gender point of view. Uh, coming back to mobility, the theme of mobility, uh, I consider that to be uh, the most important key sub-theme of the American realist novel. Okay, And uh, the prototypical novel that justifies this concern is Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Please read it. Uh, Jack Kerouac's On the Road became very famous with uh, the idea of the hippie generation, uh, you know, progression because the people were on the road for fun, for adventure. You know, you would hit the highway and you keep on driving miles out of your home. Uh, this was a, the fun thing to do, uh, though the idea of on the road is not always the fun thing to do as, as with the migrant crisis in India now. So uh, while Kerouac's novels was uh, basically for uh, adventure, in a novel like Imbolo Mubue's Behold the Dreamers, the title is Behold the Dreamers, the story is more typically that of a young Cameroonian couple. This couple is from Cameroon and they live in New York. They are also undocumented citizens. And they're fending for themselves during the 2000, uh, 2008 recession hit, you know, the recession that hit America in 2008 and took away a lot of jobs. So these people are on the road, but uh, no more for fun, because even if it is for fun, it's only what white America can afford. Uh, Black America or colored America remains in the background. There are many other examples that may be mentioned uh, of new age realist novel writing. Uh, mostly by non cisgender writers who have rewritten the codes, if not always writing back to the subject position. I'll briefly mention the names. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Rachel Kushner's The Flamethrowers can be taken as a counter to the uh, novel Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas by Hunter S. Thompson. Because uh, Thompson talks about gonzo journalism, debauchery, drugs, and desert racing. But uh, the latter novel is about intersections of art and violence in the 1970s political upheavals. So uh, realist concerns become more and more pronounced in contemporary writing. And I, I believe that it's not going to go away, no matter how many more experimental art forms come about. I can give you the example of Jacqueline Woodson's Benita Meth Moon that rewrites Jay McLearney's Bright Lights Big City from a woman's point of view once again. And uh, the former talks about the depression of a male writer who loses his family, while the latter talks about the depression of a, of a woman writer who loses her family and also becomes the victim of an ecological crisis, Hurricane Katrina, that uh, hits America. Uh, takes away her dreams of becoming 
a cheerleader and the wife of the football captain and so on and so forth and she becomes the victim of drug abuse she takes crystal meth uh, which is the meth moon that is being talked about to overcome her depression uh you have emma clines the girls this novel rewrites the epic critic of consumer culture that was so much popularized in brett easton ellis's american psycho many of you might have watched the movie as well uh, that was founded on the real life story of the manson murders in california in 1969 speaking about matrimony how can i miss that you must read uh, tyari jones's an american marriage that takes a more nuanced view of the institution of marriage uh, when contrasted to earlier novels like jonathan franzen's novel freedom you know uh, a novel like freedom talks about marriage on the rocks quote unquote the marriage is on the rocks in the burgland family but in uh, tyara jones's novel or tyari jones's novel you have a more nuanced view of the idea of institution of marriage why it's not taking place if it has taken place then what are the inherent problems is not always personal there are external factors so it becomes very pertinent for uh, from the point of view of socialist uh, or 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 social uh, experimentation so in conclusion i would say that social realism in america is crass blunt and smack on the face uh what began with samuel langhorn's controversies between neo realism and um the writers of today continue because of four propositions of realism there are four propositions of realism that remain pertinent in all generations number 1 the states are main actors of agency number 2 rationality prevails in governance number 3 the international system is anarchic number 4 the primary uh, concern in everything is survival so these four concerns shape everything and what is going to be the future of american realist fiction is hard to say because america itself is undergoing tremendous change uh, with elon musk now coming over and uh, making mars the next habitable planet and and you have the rise of the trillionaires uh, you have the amazon boss jeff bezos uh, taking over america in a major way you have the uh, you know 99 is to 1 movement where 1% controls the wealth that even the 99% cannot manage you have cataclysmic natural disasters in america uh, equivalent to nine richter scales and districts like california might get wiped out and of course you have the callous administration of the right wing post trump era so there would be more reactionary writing in future and uh, whether that's going to be realist or experimental is for time to tell so thank you very much tonmoy hello tonmoy uh, hello 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 uh, uh, now uh, uh, we can invite questions from the participants uh, and thank you for yes. this uh, uh, exhaustive and uh, brilliant lecture dada so thank you now thank you participants uh, if they want to ask anything to you directly so they can sure are there any observations or questions so is there any one to uh, have questions or put questions to uh, dr pal otherwise uh, we'll move ahead uh, uh, and we'll wind up the session it is a new idea i understand and uh, hello sir yeah yeah please go ahead yeah hello please go ahead reena 
Hello, hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, I am here. Yeah, you are, you are perfectly audible. Please say. Yes, sir. Uh, you said about the four concerns of American realism. Would you please repeat those four mm -hmm. concerns? I'll repeat that. I'll repeat that. Yeah, sure. First is that states are main actors. You know, the states are main actors. You know, of decidability. The states decide everything, not the individuals. The the second point is uh, governance has rationality. You know, the government the government in power always tries to define everything in rational terms, not in speculative terms. Uh, the third point is this that the international world system, the international world order now, is anarchic. It is an anarchic world order now. So unless your national government or governments are not uh, logical. and being logical means being realistic uh, you would have problems okay you can't afford to have fanciful governments and the fourth concern is this that the main quest for a realist novel writing or realist literature is the survival issue everyone wants to survive everyone wants to survive properly in in america you find through examples that recently happened that survival becomes a crisis at one point of time so these four concerns they govern american realist writing not only the novel but almost all forms of fiction uh, in 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 major ways thank you reena okay okay thank you thank hello shubhadeep da hi atul please uh, and I have a question. Actually, uh, you have ended your session in an interesting, uh, rather juncture. I want uh, you to elaborate on that. Actually, the factors you have mentioned. How That's do you sure. think those factors yeah. actually are going to shape the direction or trajectory of uh, future uh, 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 fiction writing? The problem. The pr The problem is this that I'm not a futurist, so <laughs> I really don't know which way things. No, actually, the possibilities. Uh, I will be. Yeah, it will be yeah. interesting if you uh, yeah. throw some light about the possibilities. Yes. You see, like uh, the idea is this that uh, modernism. I, I would also mention this that modernism was, um, um, or even postmodernism. You know, they were. uh phases of interwar periods you know after the wars after world wars you have so much of disruption that you can't comprehend reality in a normal manner so yeah. um that's the problem and 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 that's why you know and and they are all city based writers uh city based writing that takes place you know in 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 modernism metropolitan writing as we call it but realist writing is done even from provinces uh everyone uh, all the provincial writers are also realist that way okay uh tonmoy could you just give me one second i will just charge the phone uh, the phone charges down so it might go off just give me 2 minutes to charge the phone okay i'll just come back please uh, hold on yeah yeah
two parallel uh, movements would go on uh, i would say that uh, you know in times to come not only for america but for the rest of the world as well you would see that we have already entered the digital age we uh, are already with uh, ai and post humanism at work so you also have post humanist writing which is uh, take an apocalyptic writing which is taking things to a new level uh, at the same time we have uh, tremendous you know gaps in society tremendous divides in society so uh, those divides would mean that uh, certain sections of the society would continue to be tremendously depraved and deprived you see even if elon musk talks about making mars the next feasible habitat i'm sure that you and i will not be able to afford to go to mars okay so uh, this, this, yeah and we, we will not choose either and maybe leave alone mars had it been the moon i wouldn't have gone there i, I would rather uh, prefer to die in my own country in my own territory <laughs> rather than having to go but then uh, some of these ideas are very absurd you know like one good thing i like about elon musk is that he has brought uh, the ideas of tesla into operation he has materialized some of the good ideas but please don't forget that most of these ideas that are functioning are functioning on a capitalist paradigm you know and and uh, you know these are all going to be trillionaires very soon uh, we will have a race of trillionaires and and i think none of them will really have a proper idea about social change about social mobilization and uh, i'm sure that amader je prakriti dutto gulo hocche amra mane social media te bar bar kore bolte shunchi we are getting to hear people say that whatever you are doing for others don't think that you are doing philanthropy think it as part of your life think it as part of uh, actions you know part of the agenda of your own education and life Uh, so unless we emerge truly as the higher species uh, we will remain a mouthpiece you know i don't really see uh, you know uh, too much of hopefulness because the earth is massively messed up uh, but i don't see complete hopelessness either shejono uh, modernism kokhon mane tomar surface porechilo jokhon amra mane bajjik jagat ta ke ar चिंता in fact uh, the majority of the writers who write uh, only write in a normal realist madero beshibhag expatriate amitabh goshi bolo ka chutara ei mukhyamantri they all write in the realist way but then you know yeah there is a, a penchant for speculative writing there is a penchant for uh, differential experimental writing that will also go side by side रियलिज्म 
you know, even 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 romanticism was about a utopian vision for the future. So it's not, uh, yes, it's- yeah, it's it's not something to do completely with fancifying the idea of reality. But please remember one thing that American realist fiction, uh, you know, got so much of a preponderance because uh, the social problems of America were very pressing. You know, they were such big problems, such gargantuan problems that they could not be hyped. They could not be overlooked. To overlook that and write something like a colonial British brown side or, or white side was becoming too fanciful for writers like Mark Twain. And it is their legacy that we keep continuing now uh, in more and more experience. That's how I would answer your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, uh, we have to wind up the session. So, before that, I request our student, uh, Mega Chakravarti, to deliver a word of thanks to you. Mega? Yes, sir. So, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are audible. Okay. I, Mega Chakravarti, a student of Second Sim English Honors of Mainapur College Autonomous, on behalf of our department, would like to thank Dr. Shubhudi Pearl, Assistant Professor of English, Bakura University, whose enlightened lecture has greatly enriched us to huge extent. We all are really grateful to you, sir, and feel fortunate to have you in our session. I would like to thank our Honorable Principal, Dr. Gopal Chandabera, whose copious permission has enabled this beautiful session. Of course, I don't know if I will get a better opportunity to thank Professor Tanmay Kundu. So thank you very much, sir, for organizing the session and uniting all the fellow students in the adverse situation. And last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants who have joined the session and made it a grand success. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. And thank you, Tanmay, particularly. God bless all of you. And uh, I wouldn't say God bless America right now because <laughs> America is too cursed at this moment. But I would definitely say God bless India and may uh, American writing give us more insightful visions about our own country, our own uh, understanding of reality. Thank you very much. For it. I have had your mail ID with them. Yeah, sure. They can mail everything, all kinds of queries and suggestions. I will happily answer and reply back. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tanmay. Thank <laughs> you.